And if you haven't heard the name Desmond Napolis, get ready for this trailblazing 11-year-old drag kid who RuPaul is calling the future. His bravery is inspiring so many. We're going to talk to him in just a moment, but first, let's take a look at his amazing story. I am Desmond. I'm 11 years old, and I like pizza, trains, and drinking root beers, and it's caffeine-free. I also do drag, and I love to put on makeup, dresses, and wigs, and of course, jewelry if necessary. My full drag name is Desmond is Amazing. Please welcome Desmond Naples, AKA Desmond is Amazing. In school board meetings across the country, parents have been angry. Passionate parents always have spoken up for their kids at school board meetings, but this is something else, something uglier. The Department of Justice is ordering the FBI to address what it calls a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence against public school employees. Throughout 2021, school boards across America were met by crowds of angry parents. Outraged over a combination of COVID mask mandates, critical race theory, and sexually explicit material in classrooms. These tense school board meetings prompted the National School Board Association to send a letter to President Joe Biden in which the parent protests were labeled as heinous acts and likened to domestic terrorism and hate crimes. Six days later, Attorney General Merrick Garland released a memo directing the FBI to investigate the angry parents as potential terror threats and prosecute them when appropriate. But what had gotten these parents so outraged to begin with? Some of the most shocking moments from the meetings came when parents opted to read the school board members the graphic sexual content that had been assigned to their children. I don't love you. It's not you. It's just, I don't like your d or any d in that case. I don't, if you don't want me to read it to you, what was that like for my 15-year-old daughter to have to memorize pornographic material? Consider as you're listening to this text that a 14-year-old boy or girl will have access to this book with no parental oversight, no teacher oversight. With both hands, he scooped up her breast, running his thumb over the swell of them and making her nipples even harder, bowing his head and sucking first one nipple and then the other. She was wet. She was scared. She wanted him inside her, his fingers. Um, my heart breaks today because currently the flowery covered book, Felix Ever After, is checked out by a Potter Elementary student. This book contains 66 F-bombs. So I quote from the book, I can feel him, feel his heart on, which both scares the shit out of me and sends a thrill through me as I press against him, tugging on his shirt, oh my effing God. I've read two portions of books that attempt to normalize oral sex between children, as in Lawn Boy. I've shown you images from graphic novels, including masturbation and boys peeing on each other from the book titled Blankets. Other parents and school officials would defend such material as a component of what they call comprehensive sex education. Making sure that any instruction that we have in fourth through sixth grade be medically accurate, be inclusive, um, and make sure that the teachers are very well trained. More information is always better. This information is going to help the kids make healthier, happier decisions and ultimately stay safe throughout their lives. If you are an LBGTQ plus kid, there are people in TOSA who believe you are important and valued. If a parent doesn't want their student learning about anal sex, they can exclude that from the lesson. So what was really happening? Were America's schools under attack by unhinged conspiracy theorists and domestic terrorists? Or had pornographic material somehow found its way into American education? In our modern age, massive virtual libraries known as research databases 
are often provided by schools for students to complete homework assignments. Major corporations in the database industry aggregate education products and market them to schools and libraries as a K-12 appropriate alternative to the open internet. But in 2016, parents of a middle school student in Colorado were shocked to find hundreds of links to hardcore pornography embedded in the school research database provided by EBSCO. The complaints of these parents were dismissed by the Cherry Creek School District, citing their interest in supporting LGBTQ issues. Ultimately, the parents filed a lawsuit against EBSCO, leading the school district to cut ties with the corporation. Since the scandal broke in 2016, EBSCO has been regularly featured on the Dirty Dozen list of major contributors to sexual exploitation, compiled annually by the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. This Washington-based anti-pornography advocacy group has continued to find pornographic material in EBSCO school research databases across the country. Could this be brushed off as a series of innocent mistakes by a multinational corporation? Or was there a more sinister explanation? In 2013, the UK-based Sex Education Forum made national headlines when it released a pamphlet encouraging school teachers to give lessons on pornography in their classrooms. The author suggests framing such pornography lessons within discourses around media literacy and representation, gender, sexual behavior, and body image, and points to porn education in Denmark as the model. The Sex Education Forum pamphlet recommends the porn lessons should begin in year 7, when student ages range from 10 to 12 because that is the average age that pornography gets viewed, and wants teachers to keep in mind that porn is hugely diverse and not all bad. Teachers are also reminded to include children with disabilities in the porn lessons, noting that visually impaired students may access pornography differently. In 2017, the Sex Education Forum successfully lobbied to make such explicit sex education mandatory in all UK secondary schools and in 2020 the mandate was extended to all primary schools. In 2015, Danish sexology professor Christian Graugard made international headlines by suggesting that students as young as 13 should actually view pornographic material as part of sex education classes. Graugard argued that porn offers a variety of entertaining and educational properties, can be feminist, be part of the democratization of sex, and promote diversity, all towards the goal of ensuring that kids have exciting and gratifying sex lives. Graugard's shocking suggestion drew support from several major publications, including an article from The Guardian which boldly claimed it is generally agreed sex education should include pornography, and a piece from Think Progress which pondered the feasibility of implementing such a program in America. By the next year, work was already underway on a pornography class for American schools. In 2016, Emily Rothman, a pornography literacy scientist at the Boston University School of Public Health, partnered with the Boston Public Health Commission to create a pornography literacy program for adolescents. Rothman has done work for the Massachusetts government, the National Institute of Health, and the World Health Organization. In a 2018 TED Talk, Rothman explained how the idea of a porn literacy class initially came to her. In 2012, I was sitting in a crowded room full of high school students who were attending an after-school program in Boston. And my job as guest speaker for the day was to inspire them to think about how exciting it would be to have a career in public health. The problem was, as I looked at their faces, I could see that their eyes were glazing over and they were just tuning out. So then one of the two adults who worked for the program said, aren't you doing some research about pornography? Maybe tell them about that. All of a sudden, that room full of high school students exploded into laughter, high fives, I think there were some loud hooting noises. And all anyone had done is say that one word, pornography. That moment would prove to be an important turning point for me in my professional mission of finding solutions to end dating and sexual violence. 
Rothman also describes her sex-positive approach to pornography and repeats commonly used talking points of sex education advocates about the need for comprehensive and medically accurate sex education. Why would I keep an open mind about pornography? Well, I'm a trained social scientist, so it's my job to be objective. But I'm also what people call sex positive. That means that I fully support people's right to enjoy whatever kind of sex life and sexuality they find fulfilling, no matter what it involves. Adolescents are turning to pornography for education and information about sex, and that's because they can't find reliable and factual information elsewhere. Less than 50% of the states in the United States require that sex education be taught in schools, and less than half of those states require that the information presented be medically accurate. Invite the adolescents to become critical consumers of the research literature on pornography as well as the pornography itself. That really fits with adolescent development. According to Rothman, critical consumption of porn can even provide life-saving mental health benefits to the students. And we might leave class the next week and think, "I'm really glad." That there's that one kid in our class who's gay who said that seeing his sexuality represented in pornography saved his life, or there's that one girl in our class who said that she's feeling a lot better about her body because she saw someone shaped like her as the object of desire in some tame pornography. With the help of promotion by outlets such as the American Psychological Association, CBS News. The Atlantic, and the New York Times, Rothman has successfully marketed her program to educators across America. And we've learned from the number of requests for our curriculum and our training from across the U.S. and beyond that there are a lot of parents and a lot of teachers who really do want to be having these more nuanced and realistic conversations with teenagers about pornography. We've had requests from. Utah, to Vermont, to Alabama, to Hawaii. So, what was the supposedly life-saving content of the porn curriculum that was finding its way into classrooms throughout the country? A 2018 New York Times Magazine article documents a course given to a group of teenagers by porn literacy instructors Nicole Daly and Jess Elder under Rothman's watchful eye. During one lesson, the students are asked how much money they would have to be paid to be doused in semen or lick feces off of a spoon. At one point, Rothman has to step in to prevent her instructor Jess Alder from teaching the kids how to perform sexually, as not to unnecessarily alarm parents to their subversive aims. With instructor Nicole Daly expressing regret over such societal limitations. But not all porn literacy instructors would prove to be as capable of flying under the radar. In May of 2021, porn literacy made national headlines after sex educator Justine Angfante presented her version of Rothman's program to high school students at the Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School. 120 11th graders and many more through Zoom were pulled from classes and lectured about pornography without the knowledge or consent of parents. One slide in Fonte's presentation explores the many different genres of pornography, while another explores inequalities in orgasms and suggests that it is more pleasurable to be gay than straight. Unfortunately for Fonte, there were some uninvited guests to her lecture. But as a result of it being a Zoom assembly, parents were, I guess, eavesdropping into the class that day and had misinterpreted or taken out of context some of the topics that came up. At the time of the lecture, Fonte was the director of health and wellness at the Dalton School, where she also faced backlash from parents over her overly sexualized lessons, including a video shown to first graders, which appears to encourage child masturbation. Hey, how come my penis gets big sometimes and points up in the air? That's called an erection. Sometimes I touch my penis because it feels nice. Is that okay? Sometimes, when I'm in my bath or when Mom puts me to bed. I touch my vulva. You have a clitoris there, Kayla, and yes, it's okay to touch your clitoris. 
And Keith, it's okay to touch your penis. It's okay to touch yourself and see how different body parts feel, but it's best to only do it in private. Fonte's sex education program at Dalton was funded by a generous $450,000 donation from Jewish billionaire Bill Ackman's Pershing Square Foundation. On her website, Fonte states she frames her pedagogy through the lens of critical race theorist Kimberly Crenshaw's teaching on intersectionality and brags about her role in disrupting health education. While delivering the 2021 commencement address to Columbia University's public health students of color, Fonte makes clear that the primary goal of non-whites in public health should be the destruction of white supremacist society. This commemorates your hard work, intellect, and service in a game that was never designed for any of us to even play past the application fee. In other words, we aren't supposed to be here. In our world, white supremacy is when health is declared a human right, but only some have access to it. It's our communities that suffered the most fatalities. It's our communities that experienced the most violence because of our skin color, last name, or our accent. Therefore, you need to rely on ancestral tools of survival to disrupt those practices, heal from intergenerational traumas, and unlearn the stigmas that kept our people in the margins. And like Black Panther's vibranium, harnessed all of those microaggressions and adversity, transforming them into a master's degree, all while living in the master's house so that you can dismantle that house classroom by classroom, protest by protest, and vote by vote. And as a result, that house is starting to fall apart. Fonte uses shocking statistics about adolescent pornography consumption to justify porn literacy programs and argues that (laughs) porn can be good if sex ed is good, but we're not yet at that place. But what is Fonte's true intention for porn education? Fonte regularly contributes to the work of Amaze, the sex education organization which produced the controversial masturbation cartoon shown to first graders. Other videos by Amaze clarify their views on masturbation and porn consumption by children. Is it normal to watch porn? Yes, it's normal. Lots of people watch porn. After all, it's right there and it's free. Porn is not real. It's just a fantasy like, uh, like superheroes movies. Sometimes, young people will experience sexual pleasure and relieve stress and sexual tension by touching their genitals. That's called masturbation. It's very common for boys and girls. It's normal if you do it, and it's normal if you don't. Masturbation, even a few times a day, does not present a problem and is a physically safe way to express sexual feelings. During an Amaze Educator panel, Fonte outlines her biggest priority for sex-positive comprehensive sex education for pre-K students and younger. Let's talk about the future of sex ed. Um, what, what is like a big challenge or a big priority that you want to toss out there? Uh, I mean, I think, I know I'm pe- preaching the choir here, but I mean, pleasure. If we can get parents to be on board that pleasure-based sex ed with their pre-K or even earlier is the way to do this, it would be so much easier for us middle school and high school sex educators to teach because we're not spending time teaching them to unlearn all the things they've been wrongly socialized to, to you know, subscribe to. Um, I feel like that's the future. The optimist in me says it is. It's totally the right way to go. Um, and it really becomes the actual holistic, sex-positive, comprehensive um, field that we all on this panel know it to be. The best comprehensive health education is one that is integrated into every subject. Social justice education has always been a part of sex education when it's done right. And so I feel like we have this momentum to really bring about comprehensive sex ed in the ways that Amaze is producing and helping us with um, because these movements are really pushing us to uh, to move more forward into that anti-racist, pleasure-based type of activism. In another Amaze speech, entitled Comprehensive Means Intersectional, 
Fonte explains that teachers shouldn't be the only ones involved in maximizing the sexual pleasure of school children. High quality, comprehensive sex education is science based, medically accurate, and complete. When we talk about reaching students, we can't just reach the students in the time we have them. We have to reach out to parents. We have to reach out to faculty and staff. Any adult that is in this child's life, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's the bus drivers, maybe it's the security, maybe it's the cafeteria staff. We want to make sure that they are also equipped. And so it's important for us to step in because when we have comprehensive, feminist, sex positive, sex education, we're able to dismantle those gender roles. We're able to promote consent. We're able to help students have an increased level of scrutiny to really understand what their own standards of pleasure are. And if they have these high standards of what pleasure is, they wouldn't settle for anything less than that. So part of the discussion today will be covering um, the aspects of porn. Could the case of Justine Fonte be simply written off as an anecdotal example of an extremist sneaking their political activism into the classroom? A spokesman for Dalton defended Fonte's first grade masturbation lessons as part of the school's comprehensive health curriculum and described them as being developmentally appropriate according to nationally recognized standards. In a New York Times article written in defense of Fonte, cites multiple sex educators who argue that her work on masturbation and porn literacy are perfectly in line with the National Sex Education Standards created by SECUS, the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States, as well as the International Comprehensive Sex Education Standards released by the World Health Organization in coordination with UNESCO, UNICEF, and several other UN organizations. In a SICUS video discussing the importance of porn literacy education, pleasure-based sex educator and vice chair of SICUS Board of Directors, Sarah Tom Chesson, sheds some light on SICUS's social agenda. SICUS asserts that sex education is a powerful vehicle for social change. We are the only national organization solely focused on advocating for the rights of all people to accurate information, comprehensive sexuality education, and the full spectrum of sexual and reproductive health services. At SICUS, we believe that sex ed can spark social change at the nexus of many social justice movements, from racial justice and LGBTQ rights to the Me Too movement and the urgent conversations around consent and healthy relationships. Before she had a top position at SICUS, Tom Chesson was the business director for a national sex shop chain, and in addition to her leading role in determining American K-12 sex ed curriculum, she currently co-hosts a podcast which covers topics such as BDSM leather families and microdosing LSD. And what about the World Health Organization and the UN? The New York Times points out that the World Health Organization Comprehensive Sex Education Guidelines suggest discussions of pornography should begin in elementary school. The UK Sex Education Forum cited the 2016 UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, which called for mandatory comprehensive sex education in the UK less than one year before it became a reality. In a 2021 UNICEF report, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is invoked to suggest that limiting a child's access to pornography may be a denial of their human right to freedom of expression and access to information. That same year, London-based journalist Flora Gill, who is the daughter of high-level UK political official Amber Rudd, tweeted a suggestion that someone needs to create porn for children. Days later, the Twitter account for the BBC Woman's Hour podcast offered mainstream credibility to Gill's suggestion by asking, should there be age-appropriate porn for teens? Both posts use the same language of learning about consent, offered by advocates of porn literacy in America. But could comprehensive sex education standards, including the promotion of porn and masturbation to elementary school students, ever become mandatory in the United States as in the UK? As of November of 2022, the Guttmacher Institute, which tracks sex education policy, reports that 28 states currently mandate that sex education be taught in schools, and that 11 of those mandate the, quote, medically accurate 
Comprehensive Sex Education, advocated by SECUS and the United Nations. In other words, one in five states in the U.S. already mandate comprehensive sex education in all schools. So what exactly is comprehensive sex education? Where did the idea of sex positivity come from? How did SECUS and the United Nations become the authorities on sex education? How did the innocence of our children come under attack by some of the world's most powerful institutions? This series will provide answers to these questions and more by taking a comprehensive look at America's child sexualization policy.